um, deferred binding, the magic of GWT. And um, there's a reason I chose that topic. Someone wise once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's right. And um, not that I'm saying that the GWT team are aliens from some advanced technology with advanced tools, although maybe Scott is. <laughs> um, but when I, I'm, I, I say that because the, the topic is very technically dense, and um, I don't know that I'll be able to give you um, all of the knowledge that you'll need today to understand it, but I hope that I can uh, get through and cover most of it. So I have a lot of slides, and I might go a little quick. So if you find yourself getting behind, um, don't worry. Um, I'm going to put up a tutorial online and, and the presentation later so that you can actually read some of the code that maybe you can't see in the slides and go through it more slowly. Um, so, um, so it's magic in the sense that uh, it it's requires a little bit of understanding about how the compiler works to truly understand why you'll need this. And also, um, because it's not documented. <laughs> uh, if you actually today were to go out and try to do um, some deferred binding stuff, you really can't find out how to do it by going to Google's website and reading the documentation. You actually have to go out and look at some blogs. So I hope to rectify that today. OK, so here's what I'm going to try to cover uh, in this talk. Um, what, it, what is it? Why it's needed? How does DWT use uh, deferred binding? And then I'll get into the real nitty gritty of how it works under the hood. And then uh, some examples of how to create your own deferred bindings. And then if there's time left, which I hope there is, I'll take questions. So let's start, right? Everybody knows what static binding is, right? So here I have an example, connection C equals new MySQL connection. Um, wh what this shows is static binding because the variable C is, is tied at compile time to this MySQL connection class. Basically, it, that won't change. And there's no ability to defer that choice until runtime. Um, what we really want to do is we want to say connection C equals load user driver, where user driver is a variable that the user can control at runtime. Well, in Java, we solve this. We have dynamic class loading and dynamic method invocation, which basically falls under dynamic binding. It's used by a lot of Java applications. You know, you have um, inversion of co uh, control containers, you know, JDBC drivers, service provider interfaces, you know, Hibernate, you know, J2E servers. I mean, the, everybody uses this dynamic binding and reflection stuff, dynamic class loading. But there's another solution, um, and this is what GWT uses. Now, I must admit, when I first saw this, uh, I kind of thought it was sort of spin. I was like, wait a minute, deferred binding, uh, they don't have to dynamic binding, this is just trying to cover up the fact that their toolkit doesn't allow you to do reflection and cl class for name at you know, runtime. I mean, everybody wants that. I mean, this is just spin, this whole you know, deferred binding thing. But when I started to dig down deep into it, I realized that I don't want dynamic class loading in the browser, and I don't want reflection, because to have reflection in the browser would require me to carry around a large base of strings, which is the names of every method and class that was in the original Java source. And I don't want that because I want my application to load quickly. I want those variables um, and method names to be obscured down to a single letter you know, or eliminated if possible. So I mean, you know, I can't reflect on a method that's been dead code eliminated because it's no longer there. So I don't want dynamic uh, binding in my browser applications. And um, so, GWT has deferred binding. What's deferred binding? It's compile time dynamic binding. That's sort of like the analogy here. You, you're still allowed to make that user driver selection at runtime. It's conceptually similar to uh, dynamic binding, um, and it has similar capabilities in terms of reflection, you know, discovering what methods are in a class and things, but it's done at compile time. S but where it differs from dynamic binding is, is in the actual in the actualization, how it's actually realized in the code. Here's what happens. The GWT compiler determines all the possible bindings that could be um, dynamically loaded. Think of it that way. And then for each possibility, it generates an entirely separate compiled version of the application with that one loaded in. Um, you can intercept binding. You can intercept bindings, and you can delegate um, the binding to a generator. This allows you to do um, basically 
dynamic class loading in a way where you're, you know, you've seen these tools with Java where you can intercept the, the, the class loader and modify the bytecode and inject methods and new properties. This is how like Hibernate works in persistent frameworks. You can actually intercept the request for a class to be loaded by the compiler and then substitute your own on the fly where the source code basically doesn't exist, it's generated. And then at startup, when you load the, your application into the browser, a, a boot scrap uh, selection script actually loads the proper executable that has the bindings that the user wanted. For example, the, the database driver they wanted to use that analogy. Let me try to look at it another way, right? Imagine you wrote a normal J2E uh, SE desktop JDBC driver uh, uh, database application, right? And I, I had in there a line that said class.forename and it had a variable which, is the, which was the database driver that the user wanted to load. Now imagine that the Java compiler did something it doesn't do today. It went into your class path and it found every JDBC driver that you had installed, Oracle, MySQL, whatever. And then it compiled multiple versions of your application instead of just one version, where in each one that driver is bound in there. So it would compile, like for example, an Oracle version of your application and a Sybase version and a MySQL version. And then there would be a startup script that when a user said, okay, I'm gonna be working with the Oracle database, it would pick the right application that had the right driver in it. But it wouldn't pick, so if I picked the Oracle one, it wouldn't have any Sybase code or MySQL code in it at all. So, to summarize, static binding, foo f equals new foo. Dynamic binding, class C, class that forename, you know, new C dot new instance, everyone's seen that before. The new thing is deferred binding, you don't new the class you call, or call class that forename, you call gwt.create and you pass in uh, the class that you want to create and it returns an instance of it. So, let's discuss why it's needed. Smaller code. So, when you're developing GWT apps, um, you have the situation where you've got multiple sets of functionality in terms of different browser implementations, you've got multiple locales, um, and there's other permutations you can have um, that I don't discuss here because it's going to get too complicated. But, you know, why should a Firefox user have to download code in there that makes the, the code base work with op an Opera browser? That's the situation you get today with a lot of these job, pure JavaScript frameworks. They'll have code in there like, you know, if element has, you know, this property on it, then, you know, I'm going to put opera specific code. Or if the element has this property on it, I'm going to put IE specific code. Well, it's a long if statement with all these cases for every browser, and it's all over the place in these frameworks. And why should that code be downloaded to every user? Likewise, uh, I mean, if I'm a Chinese user, why should I have to download code that has a bunch of English strings bound into it? You're just increasing the download size for that user when he doesn't need it. So if you try to do these things dynamically, which is what some JavaScript frameworks do, where they basically inject a script tag to load up, uh, you know, let me load up the Opera support library, or let me load up the Chinese resources, you invariably increase your startup time, because what happens is um, the, uh, you know, the browser has to go and load those things up, and your app can't even get up and running until it's loaded up your Chinese resources, right, to, to show you know, the, the, the labels and things. So, um, Basically, you don't really want that. So dynamic binding also makes optimization uh, more difficult. The compiler can't analyze code that it can't see. So if the compiler hasn't seen the MySQL database driver because it doesn't even know it's going to be loaded until runtime, it can't inline calls to like exec you know, an SQL statement. Um, the GWT compiler sees all source code at compile time and it optimizes each permutation, and I'll, I'll discuss more what the permutation is, as if dynamic bindings are statically bound. Here's an example, right? Let's say we have an interface or a base class called animal, right? And I ask GWT to create me an animal class. And then let's say that there's bindings that exist, um, which I'll get to later in the module file, which specify rules of how to intercept that and replace it with another class. Let's say, well, when someone asks for an animal class, sometimes I'll replace it with a cat, and sometimes I'll replace it with a dog, right? Well, if you were to invoke a method on it, like a.speak, right, and let's say the cat has a method which speaks meow, and the dog has a method which says woof, right? 
GWT can inline those calls, cat.speak and dog.speak, and it can also remove code that's not touched by um, one of the other classes. So for example, if the cat class were to touch some other GWT widget, and the dog class didn't, and you, had a, uh, you were loading up a, a version of the app that only used the dog class, GWT not only won't include the cat class, it won't even include that widget. It will just eliminate everything. Um, and I'd just like to note that Java C can't do this kind of optimization, and in fact, Hotspot can't even do it under some circumstances. It uses a complicated system called class hierarchy analysis, and it's often foiled um, by uh, a lot of dynamic class loading. So th this kind of delves in a little detail. Let's say you had class dog uh, implements animal, and I have like public void speak window.alert woof, right? And I say, quit, please create me an animal. And I have a rule somewhere where I know that that's going to return a dog, actually. So it's being assigned to an animal interface variable type, but it's really a dog underneath. And I invoke the a.speak method. Well, here's what the GWT compiler reasons, right? Animal a, it transforms that GWT create call into an animal a equals new dog. Then the next thing it notices is there's no other implementations of the animal class anywhere that I can see for this permutation. So I'm going to just change that to be dog A equals new dog. That's called type type name. Then what it notices is that the speak method ha has no overrides. There's no subclasses that override that. So it can basically treat it as a final method. Then it goes, okay, well, I'll just make that a static method. It doesn't even need to be on the class anymore. And then finally it can do something like I'm going to get rid of the method altogether and just put the window.alert right there at the call site. Uh, Needless to say, this, ad, this basically um, increases performance tremendously in a lot of code. Here's a more real world example. I'm just going to go through this really quick because uh, you saw Bruce do it, which is the set inner text um, example. He used it with a button uh, widget. Basically, it delegates to multiple uh, implementations. There's one called DOM Impl, there's one called DOM Impl Safari, one called DOM Impl Mozilla, and they all implement a, a different way of setting the inner text property of an element. Um, I.e., for example, uh, has this implementation, which is I can just go element.innerText equals text. But Safari, for example, doesn't have that property, so it actually has to remove all the, the children and then add a text node, so it's slower. Uh, the takeaway from this, though, is that if, the, if a person using I.E. loads this code up, actually he just gets one line of code in the JavaScript, which is element.innerText equals test. Whereas the Safari user gets this, and we don't force the I.E. user to download this. So, um, what does this give us? Also give us, gives us fewer round trips. So in a typical web application, you know, you're loading up external JavaScript, you're loading up CSS, external images, every one of those is an external HTTP request. And if you've um, went to Josh's presentation, you know that anytime you do an HTTP request, you're adding massive performance penalties to your app. So we don't want that. And what deferred binding allows us to do is to sort of crunch down all of the resources that our app needs into a single image, um, if possible. And you can kind of think of it as programming for like an embedded environment. That's how I like to think of it. Like if you're doing a phone app or you were putting software into like a printer or something like that, if you're doing embedded development, uh, in, especially with small memory for footprint devices, you want to throw away every last line of code that's not going to be used by that, in that um, firmware. So you want aggressive whole program optimization, and you want all the resources that that thing's going to use to basically be placed into the ROM. You don't want them to be loaded in out of RAM. So basically you want to crunch everything down into a single binary image. And so you can think of what GWT does as basically treating the browser like it's, 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 it's uh, an embedded environment where your applications are like these firmwares that you load up. But I mean, that's just my analogy, so I mean, someone else might have a different one. So uh, you can also extend the Java language with uh, um, uh, deferred bindings. You can basically add annotations to your source code and you can have GWT intercept them and then call back to code that you write called generators which will basically look at those annotations and do something special. One of the examples is uh, Bob created uh, something called uh, the, the um, JavaScript interop library which allows me to basically create a Java interface and I can name all of the methods in that interface the same as methods in like a third-party JavaScript library like Dojo or Google Maps API. And if the method names match up, what his um, code can do is it can automatically generate an implementation of that interface that will invoke the uh, third-party pure JavaScript library. So it provides sort of like an automatic glue mechanism for reusing uh, external JavaScript libraries um, 
from inside Java code without having to write JSNI. But the most super cool example, and this is, I love this, right, is image bundles. I mean, this is like an awesome thing in GWT, right? Basically, because the way people do this today is they do it by hand. So let's say I wanted to take, and Josh discussed this, right? I have a toolbar and it has a bunch of images on it, like, you know, new document, it has a little disk, floppy disk icon for like saving the document. Maybe it has like a pair of scissors for, you know, cut. And I maybe have 20 icons that I'm going to basically put on widgets. Well, that's going to be 20 HTTP requests in a normal app. Well, what people do today is they create these things called, um, you know, CSS sprites, for example, is one name they give it, where they take all those images and they put them in one image, and then they use sort of like tricks with the, the DOM to, to clip down, you know, in that one image to show like the floppy disk, to show the icon for the cut, copy, and paste, and so on. And they do it by hand. They load these things up into Photoshop, and they combine the images, and they sort of tweak this thing by hand. Well, GWT does this automatically. Here's what you do. Basically, you create an interface and you extend image bundle. And for each image you have, you make a method. So I have my submit button, my load button, my cancel button, right? And it returns an image object. And basically then I say, GWT, go create that. What happens? Well, image bundle is tied to a generator. So the deferred body mechanism basically defers to a callback class that someone in the GWT team wrote. And the generator looks at all the methods on that interface, my submit button, you know, my cancel button and goes and sees if there's a GIF, JPEG, or PNG icon on the disk that has the same name as that method. Then what it does is it concatenates all of the images it found into a single mosaic image, and then the browser is instructed to only load that one file that contains all the images, and then every time you call one of your methods on your interface back there, like my submit button, what it does is it returns like a little clipping rectangle of, this, of the mosaic image that only shows that piece. So it can reduce, you know, 100 HTTP requests down to one if your app has a lot of like little images, like rounded corners and icons everywhere. I mean, this is an amazing improvement and an amazing productivity um, boost if you basically want to start using these like CSS sprite things. Because otherwise, if you're like a pure JavaScript programmer, you're loading up Photoshop doing these things. So you've heard the mantra: Why do at runtime what you can do at compile time? And that's basically um, what you're going to see in this talk. So how does GWT use it? I, I discussed image bundles already. Uh, if you went to Rob's talk yesterday on RPC, you've seen that it generator, um, deferred binding generators are used for RPC. Um, it's used in browser detection. So basically, we have like a DOM class, and there's multiple versions of this DOM class, one for IE, one for Safari, to implement all the standard DOM features like set inner text, set element, append child. But it's different for each browser because it's a more optimal version for each browser. And what deferred binding does, it swaps in the implementation um, of the one that's needed for the, um, the browser that's viewing the application. But it does it at compile time, not at runtime. And localization, I already discussed that. You, know, you might have different locales, you know, Chinese, French, and so on. Um, basically, it can take property files that you would normally look at um, in, uh, in doing Java with like resource bundles, and it can convert them into Java interfaces and make implementations that um, bind those strings essentially into the source code of your app. <clears throat> I'll sh I don't know if I'll show that today, but let me talk about the nitty gritty details of how this works, right? All of the deferred binding stuff is controlled by what's called the module file. Now you've seen, normally you've seen um, the you know, .gwt.xml file being used to specify like, you know, where, what, what libraries am I inheriting from, and where's my source located, where's my public directory located. But um, there's a bunch of tags that can be placed in that file that are not really documented anywhere. And <clears throat> if you take anything away from this conference today, it's to basically learn the hidden elements that can be placed into that um, module file. So, um, basically, a module file declaration uh, for deferred binding consists of two things. You're going to define basically uh, something called a property, and then you're going to define um, rules to basically uh, case off of that property and conditionally replace classes based on the, the value of the property. Um, then, you're gonna, then I'm going to show you something called the per, uh, permutation generation and the selection script. Okay. Properties, what are they? Well, you define an enumerated set of values in, um, that are attached to a variable name. For example, there's a property in the standard GWT library called user.agent. And it can take on values like, uh, I think it's gecko, gecko18, uh, ie6, 
uh, maybe Safari or Opera, uh, I don't remember all of them. And then what do you, they have is they have a bunch of rules which says, you know, if the browser, uh, if the property user agent is equal to, let's say, Gecko18, then you should replace any request uh, for a DOM impl class to be DOM impl Mozilla, for example. Um, or, if, or if the value of the um, uh, property locale is equal to you know, um, French, then you should replace any request for you know, um, my message bundle with my message bundle underscore fr, um, things like that. So uh, you can also define conditions about you know, how is this rule to be executed because it's, it's, it can be more than just you know, the value has to match exactly. You can have Boolean logic. So let's show you an example here. We can start with a declaration of an initial enumeration. I'm going to create a new one, define property, name equals browser, and then I'm going to define a comma separated list of values that enumerate the possible values that that property can take on. In this example, IE6, Firefox, Safari, and Opera. Um, and you can set a default value statically um, if you want to. I can say, for example, if it's not specified otherwise, the, the default value for this browser property is IE6. Um, Microsoft will love that, but you know, I, maybe I should use Firefox as an example. So a property can also be set at runtime. This is typically the case because you know, if I just had that set property to be a value of IE6, then there would be no possibility for GWT to pick a, a different binding for like the DOM impl class because it would never change. It would always be IE6. But what you can do is you can use this property provider tag in the module, and here I'm saying property provider name equals browser, that's the property that I'm going to define. And inside I put JavaScript that's evaluated um, when you load up the application that will return the value, one of those values back there, you saw IE6 Firefox, based on runtime uh, inspection. So I'm saying like, you know, if it's IE, then I'm returning IE6. Else if I, dis you know, if I discover the user agent's Firefox, I'll return Firefox. Um, or, you can set the property in the head of the HTML uh, document. You can put a meta tag, name equals DWT colon property, and uh, content, and in the content attribute you have the property name equal to the, the value. So here I'm, again, I'm you know, giving props to Microsoft and saying it's IE6. Um, modules can inherit your property. So if you write a, a reusable third-party GWT library and you define a new property, um, like, like I said with browsers, somebody else later can extend your property. Like let's say they want to support another browser. They could put in their module XML, they can say extend property name equals browser values equals iPhone. And that adds another um, value to the set of enumerated values that that property can take on. Now why is it important to tell GWT up front what are the possible values that this property can take on? I mean, why not just have it open-ended? It can just be any arbitrary string. Why does it have to be one of a set of values? Um, I'll talk about that later when we discuss permutation generation. We can instruct the compiler to replace one class with another um, by writing conditions that look at these property values. So if here I'm saying that if I want to replace all dogs with cats when the property cats rule the world is true, I'll write a rule like this which says replace with class equals org.cats.cat when the type the person's trying to create is org.dogs.dog, but only do it when the property uh, ruling species is equal to cats. So basically, if somebody uh, tried to create a dog class and there was a property and its value happened to be uh, ruling species is equal to cats, then when you, the person got the value back, it actually wouldn't be a dog class, they'd get a cat class. So this allows you a, a way to basically replace um, classes at, uh, essentially it looks like you're replacing them in the class loader, but you're doing it in the compiler. Um, but in addition to replacing classes with another class that exists that you wrote, you can actually replace them with something that gets generated on the fly. It doesn't actually exist until the compiler starts compiling. Um, and with this, you get um, something that's akin to reflection in Java, like the Java Lang reflect method. You get this thing called a type oracle that essentially allows you to look at all of the source, uh, the types that exist uh, that the compiler can see, and then generate uh, some source code uh, based on that introspection that actually implements something. Um, and here's an example, right? Let's say um, I have a class called, an uh, interface called virtual cat, okay? It's just an interface. There's no actual implementing class of virtual cat, like a real cat. And 
I have a rule here in my module.xml file which says whenever you see a virtual cat, someone requesting to make one of these things, invoke this thing called cat generator. And what cat generator is going to do is it's just going to print out you know, public class cat implements virtual cat, for example. It's going to generate source code that the compiler is then going to compile. And I'm going to show you a complete example of how that works uh, later. Um, so here's a list of all the conditions that you can place on how to run these rules, whether it's replace with or generate with. You can say when the type uh, matches a, a, a specific uh, class, so you know, replace uh, a, uh, a dog with a cat when the type is dog. You can say when type assignable, this handles a superclass situation. So I could say when type assignable is animal, um, replace you know, a cat with a dog. Um, when the property name is a certain value, I've showed you that one. So if you know browser is equal to IE6, replace DOM impl with DOM impl IE6. Uh, and Boolean logic support. So you can say, you know, any of these rules, you can OR them together, you can end them together, and you can negate them. So, you know, replace this class with this class when it's not IE6, when it's any of the other browsers. Okay, permutation generation. Um, what's permutation generation? Let me check the time real quick. Okay. Well, remember in the beginning I discussed this idea of like, you know, if let's say you had, uh, you were compiling an application normally in Java J2SC and it was loading up a database driver, you discover all the drivers that are pos could possibly be loaded, you generate a separate version of the application, each one having a different driver loaded into it. Well, this is what permutation generation is. Basically for every property that exists, for every property value, it's going to compile a different version of your application. So, I showed you an example where the property browser had four different um, properties, uh, values, uh, like um, Safari, Opera, IE6, Firefox. That means Gwent will compile four different versions of your application. There'll be four generated JavaScript files, and a different one will get loaded depending on you know, which browser is visiting the page. Um, however, if you've got more than one property, which is often the case, you sort of get you know, a, a Cartesian product or you, know, you get a, you know, a, a, a join, essentially, database terminology of, of all the possible values, right? So here's an example, right? I've got one axis, which is the, the property browser, and it takes on the values Firefox, Opera, Safari, and IE6. And maybe along the other axis, I've got locale, and I've got you know, versions of my app that are English, French, and Chinese. Well, GWT going to compile 12 different versions of your application. One that's Firefox English, one that's Safari Chinese, you know, one that's IE6 and French. And um, basically, each one will only have the classes necessary for that particular browser and locale combination. So it's going to be really compact. It's not going to have any extraneous code that's from any of the other um, you know, things that, are, that would be bound in, like a different browser or locale. Now, what's probably coming to your mind is, you know, like, oh my god, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, 12, I mean, 12 versions of my application. You know. However, um, sometimes two or more permutations can map to the same compile code, so it's not strictly you know, an you know, n times m situation. And also, you know, what's wrong with trading cheap server disk space for reduced bandwidth usage, reduced server pressure, and faster user experience? I mean, disk space is cheap. These GWT applications are like 100 kilobytes, you know, so you, you compile 12 versions, it's 1.2 megs, so a big deal. But you know, you're saving the user from downloading a huge amount of extra code, and it's starting up so much faster. So, you know, your users are going to thank you for creating a really small, fast app, and I don't think your server admins are going to complain by using up a little bit of extra disk space. So, what is the selection script? I discussed this before. Well, you've got all these uh, permutations out there. You know, Firefox Chinese and IE6 French. So, a user, you know, a French IE6 user comes to the, the load up your page. And how does Wit know which one of those things to load up? Which one of the ones it compiled to load up? Well, that's what the job of the selection script is. It basically determines the values that those properties are going to take on, like browser equal IE6, locale equal French. And then it goes and picks the script that it compiled that's specifically for IE6 and for um, uh, French and loads only that one up. Um, but there's more. This allows something else. It allows something called perfect caching. Because the way that GWT generates these scripts and their file names, they're essentially unique in like a 120-bit file name space. It's essentially a really large space. And you can basically set the cache to expire forever on, on these permutations. And once somebody loads up one of these scripts, they visit your application once, the browser never requests again to load it. 
So if it's like a 100 kilobyte script or 150 kilobyte script, the next time they come, the only thing that loads up is this bootstrap code, which is like a thousand, you know, 1K of data. So it basically allows you to tell the, 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 your clients, essentially your browsers, that never re-download the script ever. Now you might be saying, well, what's going to happen if I make a change? Right? Well, what happens is, is that the bootstrap, bootstrap script changes and it will go load up a different file name of, of the new um, unique file name that GWT assigns to these generated permutations. They're always unique, so they're based on the content of the JavaScript that's generated. So if, two, if, if you have basically, if you made a change to your code and the generated JavaScript's different, it's essentially going to um, ch- make the selection script load up the newer version when the person comes. So they'll get, the, the, telling it to cache it forever won't harm you, but it will boost your performance a lot. All right, so now I'm going to basically go through an example of how to create your own deferred binding. <coughs> I'm going to use two examples. One, I'm going to show you basically a uh, replacement, which is I'm going to show you how to replace one implementation with another. And then the second one, I'm going to show you how to do a generator. In this case, the example is to do the equivalent of the Java bean introspector, but do it in GWT. <coughs> so the example we're going to do is we're going to do basically a little sort of uh, toy logging interface, um, basically where you can log um, to this interface. And we're going to have two different ones, one for debug and one for production. So here's our logger interface. Interface logger just has one method, void log, and it takes a string to log. And here's how we would create one. We say logger log equals gwit.create logger.class. Now, that's an interface. So you know that it's not going to simply knew, knew that. OK. Um, it's basically going to have to replace it with something else. So what it's going to replace it with is it, it, it goes into the module file. And here we have basically a property called logger, and it can take on values debug and production. Then, um, we, if we want to, we can set a default value. For example, I can say that, well, the default value of this logger variable, if it's not set or overridden, is production. Then I'm going to say how to map those properties into uh, re- classes that replace that interface. So here I'm saying replace with the class debug logger when the type that the person is requesting to create is a logger. When the, when the property name logger's value is debug. So I'm going to replace request for the logger interface with a debug logger when the property of lo- the, prop- the value of the, the logger property is equal to debug. And you do the same for uh, the production logger. So here's an example of a debug logger uh, implementation I wrote. Okay, it's just going to pop up a window in your browser, which is going to annoy the hell out of you if you got more than one you know, log call. Um, so how would we choose which version, production or debug? Well, you could put a GWT colon property um, declaration. Uh, oh, that's, that's wrong. But, and you could, put that in, you could put a meta tag in the head of your document which selects which logger to use. You can put a, a, a variable on the URL, like logger equals debug, logger equals production. But you'd have to write a, a custom property provider to go look at the URL to set that. Uh, and you could also you know, write separate versions for Firefox uh, debug console if you wanted to. So here's an example of how you would write that um, property provider if I wanted to actually use the question mark logger equals something. I'd declare a property provider tag for the logger property, and then I'd have a little snippet of JavaScript. The first one is I'd try to go parse the URL and look for question mark logger equals something, and I'd return that if it exists. Otherwise, I would go get, I would use this basically undocumented call uh, called GWT get meta property, which would go look in the head of the the host document. So um, that's that. Now I'm going to go into an introspector. And I'm going to kind of speed up because I've been given uh, you know, 10 minutes. Um, so if you find yourself getting lost, I'm going to put this material online. And um, um, if you go to my blog, there will be a tutorial later. Basically, it goes more into depth. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to create an interface called introspector. And the idea is, is I can basically use this to, to basically introspect any other class and get its list of bean properties, namely getter and setter methods. Um, so to use this thing, you would derive an interface from this introspector. And you'd basically um, uh, put annotations um, on it to say what class you want to introspect. So here's an example. right? I'm going, to, I'm going to create an interface called myspecter, which extends introspector. And I'm going to have a, a method on it called getFoo. And it returns an array of strings. This, this method has no implementation. This is just an interface. Now, there's an annotation I put in the Java doc which says 
at gwt.introspect org.company.foo. This is just purely a, an annotation uh, in the Java doc, and it basically says that I want to basically go look at that class, org.companyFoo, find all of its get and set bean properties, and return them from that getFoo method. So this is how you would use the class. You'd say GWT to create my specter.class, and then you'd say get a list of the bean properties of the foo class by saying, calling the getFoo method. Now, how does that getFoo method get implemented? It doesn't exist. I haven't written it. Well, it can be generated on the fly. And here's how you would do it. First, you go into the uh, introspector and uh, that quit.xml, that would be your module file, and you basically have a generate with declaration, which says when the variable that the person is trying to create is a subclass or subinterface of introspector, run the code that's in my generator. Oh, note, generators are not translatable in the JavaScript. They actually run inside the compiler. So you don't put them in the client package. You put them, by convention, in a rebind package. OK, so how do we implement a generator? <coughs> Let me check my time. There. OK, uh, we place it in the rebind package. We extend the class called com google gwit core ext generator. We override the generate method um, with the signature you see there. We call a method called try create which can create a .java file on the disk and give us back a print writer. So this is where we print the Java code. So we say, quit, open this file on disk, you know, my implementation.java, and give me back a print writer, and I'm going to start printing source code to it. Um, then um, we're going to basically inspect type information using this thing called the type oracle. And then we're going to uh, return, finally, the fully qualified name of the class that we generated on the fly. So Gwit compiler then knows where to go to compile it. OK. So here's a skeleton of the generator. It's not complete. Basically, uh, we try to first create a class called test impl there. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I'm just making up a name. Test, it will be test impl.java and disk in the package called test. In the next line, we print out the source code to that to the print writer. Package test, public class test impl implements my specter. Public string get foo returns string zero. So I, for now, it's stubbed out, doesn't do anything. And finally, at the end of the method, I return test.myspecterimple. This is a typo. It should be test.myimple for now. But I correct it in a later slide. <laughs> OK. So the problems with, I just showed you the test. The impl class is always called testimple. It really should be based on the name of the interface uh, that, that's being asked to be generated with. The package is fixed as test, and the get foo method is stubbed. Let's fix those. All right, just quickly though, to go over this, right? Here is the analogs for Java reflection versus what Gwit calls the type oracle, the equivalents, right? Class that for name, and Gwit use type oracle that find type. The class object in Java is called J class type in Gwit. The method object in you know Java reflection is called J method, parameter versus J parameter. Uh, field versus J field. OK, so now let's start uh, fixing this, right? First thing we're going to do is we're going to compute the name. Back here, we basically called it, always call it test package and test impl. Now we're going to actually compute those from the uh, class that's being asked to be created, which was my specter, right? So we're going to call type oracle, like uh, by find type, the requested class, which is something like, you know, org.something.my specter. That was the interface I asked Gwit to create. And I'm going to get the package name by calling get package I get name. I'm going to get the class name by calling get simple source name. That would be my specter, the name of the interface. And then I'm going to append impl to the end of it, right? So I'm going to create a new class that's basically something dot something my specter impl. And then the rest of the stuff's the same from the previous slide, right? Um, except that, uh, now you can see it has public class gen class, which is the name I calculated. So next, I'm basically going to implement the getFoo method. Right? So rather than stubbing it out, I'm going to call a method called genMethods, which is basically going to um, figure out what that method's going to return. So here's the genMethods um, um, function. What I do is I basically look over the type, which was my specter, and find all the methods it had declared. Now, if you remember back here, right, it only had uh, one method, which was getFoo. So I loop over that, find all of the ones. Right now, it's only one. And then I ask that method, what metadata do you have? And I'm looking for something called gwt.introspect. Well, if you remember back here, I had uh, this declaration, at gwt.introspect org.company.foo. So I want that org.company.foo, because I want to know what class you want me to go introspect. 
So um, if we go back here, um, you can see that I get back the metadata, and then I get the class to introspect, um, which is uh, uh, the next to last line, and then I call this method called gen method. That class to introspect will be org.company.foo. Then in gen method, I'm going to go look that up in the Oracle. So I'm going to go look up org.company.foo, which, which, which was from that annotation. And then I'm going to get a list of all of its methods. Um, you can ask the Oracle uh, for a class type. And then basically, you can ask the um, uh, class type for all of its methods. Just like in Java Reflection, you can ask a class uh, for all of its methods. So basically, I loop over every method. And that's that little for loop. And I say, is it a bean method? And if it is, add it to this list. And then basically generate this string method, which is public string get, um, and it will be like get foo. And it will return the list of the, of the methods, the bean methods that it found. And then the is bean method um, essentially, I apologize for keep looking up there, but I'm trying to go fast, so I have to look at the, the slide. Um, the, the, the bean method basically looks at the parameters, and if it's a get method, it basically looks to see that the, le the, the next letter after the get is capitalized, and that basically it doesn't take any parameters. So this is a simplification of the way the bean introspector does it in Java, but basically I, a bean property for me in this case is it begins with get, the next letter is uppercase, and it, has no, it takes no parameters. So then I basically uh, print out a list of all those properties. I'm just going to skip this and basically uh, go into the summary slide to try to take questions. So in summary, uh, deferred binding, what do we do? We provides, it provides code generation and dynamic binding at compile time. It really does. It allows the GWT compiler to perform a really impressive set of optimizations. I really wish there was a separate uh, talk here just on the kind of stuff that the GWT compiler does, because it's really amazing. And in the upcoming version 1.5, it's, it's even more incredible. It, it, it doubled the performance of my app, literally. Um, basically, you can dramatically reduce the network route trips by crunching all of the resources that your app needs into a single image. And then you can perfectly cache that one image so that browsers never load it more than once. And basically, that's why I think it's magic. So uh, if you want a more complex tutorial, um, you might want to write this down or just go to timepedia.blogspot.com. Um, but I have a really complex tutorial up there that shows you how to create a generator that will automatically generate JavaScript bindings for a GWT application. So let's say you've got some pure JavaScript developers. They don't want to use any Java. They don't want to use GWT at all, right? And you wrote a class in GWT. How can you make it so that somebody can call that? Like one of your pure JavaScript developers can call methods on your Java classes. Well, this is what uh, this tutorial describes. It describes something called the GWT exporter that exports Java interfaces into a JavaScript environment so that you can get basically JavaScript developers on board using you know, GWT classes. Uh, so uh, has everybody writ wrote that down? If you didn't write it down, just go to timepedia.blogspot.com or go to timepedia.org, and you can find my blog. And then basically, you can find it in one of the articles that's there. Thank you very much, Ray. <laughs> we have time for maybe one question. It better be a good one. We're a little bit over the deadline. I'll take one question. Right there? Got a very eager person way in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, it's possible. It depends on the browser's, you know, policy. I mean, usually the browser has a bound on the size of the cache, right? Like the browser will say, "Well, your disk cache is one gig or something," or 100 megs or whatever for your browser cache. And probably they would expire stuff you know, on a least recently used mechanism. So if you weren't going to that app every day, that thing would probably disappear. Uh, but that's just my speculation. I haven't really verified that. But I would think that's what, how it would work. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We have to defer any further questions to the break time outside. If you want to chase Ray to the coffee, I'm sure he'll answer <laughs> anything you have. And you'll be at the product showcase tonight? Uh, yeah, and also I'm at the GWT tools panel, um, so I'll be discussing a little bit more about how uh, we're using GWT at my company right. and uh, some of the tricks we're using and things like that if people are interested. Mm -hmm.